Today I'm going to go over the chapter 10 comprehension checks from the Marine Builders Chemistry book. This is the title called, or the, this is the chapter titled, it's a gas and it's all about gas laws and how gases behave. One of the things that you need to figure out is you need to understand how a chemist calculates pressure. And so you may remember some pressure from physical science, but we're going to do a quick review of how we measure pressure. So um, pressure is calculated in physics mostly by using the force over the area. And when we have a unit for force, we use Newtons. And we haven't talked about this in this class. That's why I say if you remember it from physical science. But the, measure, the unit for area is meters squared. And so with pressure being force over area or Newtons over meters squares, we get a new unit called a Pascal. And so a Pascal is really just a measurement of how much the pressure is pushing down. And so we can calculate that. Sometimes you may know of like an atmosphere. And so the weight of the atmosphere of the air over us at sea level is usually calculated um, a little bit above sea level. So the pressure of air for me should technically be a little bit less than that but it's 101,325 pascals is what um, an atmospheric pressure is at sea level. Another measurement for pressure that we use is a tor. And so one atmosphere is 760 tors. And then the other thing that you actually will see is millimeters of mercury because it's actually taken from a barometer where you would have had mercury that rose up the barometer and you just measured how many milliliters of mercury went up the barometer. And just like in TORS, 760 millimeters of mercury are one atmosphere of pressure. So we have a lot of ways of measuring pressure, Pascal's atmosphere, TORS, and millimeters of mercury. And I think we actually are going to see all of these in this book. So maybe just write them down on your little note card that you're keeping formulas on so that you have it handy. Comprehension check question number one tells us that a barometer reads a pressure of 750.1 tor. How many atmospheres is that? And is it above or below the average air pressure at sea level? So a barometer is just a device you may have in your home. It may be electronic, or sometimes you may actually have an analog one that you can see. Um, sometimes there's a science experiment where you take a jar and you put a balloon on it with a straw and you can kind of make a little barometer for your house. It's kind of fun to do if you want to sit and watch one, but it measures the air pressure. And so basically it wants us to convert that into TOR. So we're going to use the factor label method that we've been using to cancel out units to convert from TORs to atmospheres. I'm starting with what I know. I'm going to atmosphere, so I'm going to put it on the top and I'm going to put TORs on the bottom so it cancels out. And the ratio for tors to atmosphere is 760 tors is one atmosphere. When I take 750.1 and I divide it by 760 tors, I'm left with 0.987 atmospheres. Now the next part of the question asks, is this above or below the average for air pressure at sea level? And the reason it doesn't just say the air pressure at sea level is when we say sea level is one atmosphere, that's actually an average. The air pressure can go up or go down, depending on the weather. You can have high pressure systems or low pressure systems. And so it's actually an average. And so the average is one, so this is below. So it's below the average pressure at sea level. So for the second question of the comprehension checks, we need to learn about what the Kelvin scale is. So we get another unit to add. The Kelvin scale is like a measure of temperature, but it's based on a, something called an absolute zero. So what the Kelvin scale is based on how much particles move. And so if we think about a particle at zero degrees Kelvin, it has no movement at all in that particle. But we know that even though atoms can get relatively still in solids, they are always still vibrating some. And so the Kelvin scale, there is an absolute zero on the scale, but it's never actually reached. Kelvin is the temperature that we use when we are dealing with gas law. So we need to remember and learn how to calculate back and forth from Celsius or Fahrenheit to Kelvins. So I have rewritten the formula from Fahrenheit to Celsius. It has been quite a while since we've actually done this calculation from Fahrenheit to Celsius. If you don't remember it, 
I don't know what chapter it is. It's probably like one of the first few chapters of the book, but we'll get there. So the question asks, a chemical reaction is run at a temperature of 156.7 degrees Kelvin. What is that in Celsius and in Fahrenheit? And so this is just so that you get practice going back and forth between them. So this is the formula for a Kelvin. I'll just write it down up here for all the others. So Kelvin is just your degrees in Celsius plus 273.15. So that's kind of like the easiest one to figure out for this. So it would be, I'm just gonna plug in my information. And solve it for C, so the Celsius the Celsius is negative 116.5 degrees Celsius. Now I can't go from Kelvin's, I can't go from Kelvin's to Fahrenheit. I have to go from Kelvin's to Celsius, and then I can go from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So when you're using the Fahrenheit, like I said, it's been a moment since we've used this formula, you can use nine fifths, or many of my students like to use 1.8 as a decimal. But also you have to remember order of operations. If there's a place where people mess up in this equation, it is that they don't do the multiplication first. So make sure that you do the multiplication first before you do the addition. And you get Fahrenheit of 177.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So, 156.7 degrees Kelvin converts to negative 116.5 degrees Celsius and negative 177.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Before you get to question number three, there's quite a few new equations you're introduced to in the book, but we can kind of sum those all up into one equation and we call that the combined gas law. So before you read about the combined gas law, you're gonna to get to meet a Boyle's law and Charles's law. But if you can get the combined gas law down, you're going to be able to work through these problems. So basically this is one side of the gas. And if we alter anything to it, this is like the gas in its second stage. So I've got like my original pressure, volume and temperature, and then what's gonna happen to it as I alter the pressure, the volume or the temperature. So to try to help you through this, I'm just gonna walk you through step number three and it'll help you do a pretty good job of trying to explain it. But where you see the one, these are just all the conditions of the gas initially. And then where you see the two, same gas, but just the conditions have probably changed. Question number three tells us that a gas is compressed under constant temperature. And it starts out with a volume of 150.1 milliliters and it ends up with a volume of 75.6. So I already know that the temperature is going to stay the same. So if I was in algebra act like this temperature was the same, it's not going to affect the equation if it's like say one, if the T is one on this side and the T is one on this side. So I'm just gonna look at this equation using pressure and volume and ignore the temperature part. So I'm gonna be using just the P1, V1, P2, V2, and that's the Boyle's law. But if you know the combined gas law, you can get what you need out of it. So I know the temperatures are the same and it tells me the volume is gonna be changing. And it also tells me my initial pressure and I'm looking for a final pressure. So I'm gonna just take this equation and start plugging it in. So P1, V1, P2, V2. So the first pressure, 750 torres. And the volume, and make sure my units are the same. So the volume is 150.1 milliliters. Now I don't know P2, that's what I'm looking for, but I do know V, the volume, the end. So now I'm algebraically just going to solve for P. I take 750, multiply it by 150.1, and then you're going to divide it by 700 you're going to divide it by 75.6 and you are actually left with p2 
and I'm going to use tours for my units because tour is what I was giving it to. So my result was 1,500 tours. So basically, if I have some volume of gas, it's easy to think of a balloon, and it's at a 750 torr pressure, and it takes up 150 milliliters, but I'm going to be shrinking that balloon down from 150 milliliters to 75 milliliters. And so as I push those molecules together, the pressure should go up. And as you'll see in my formula, it goes from 750 to 1,500. So as I'm, that volume of the gas is getting smaller, the pressure that the gas is pushing out is getting greater. So for problem number four, I did not write the whole problem down because it's really long. But essentially, a balloon is floating on the surface of a lake. It tells us its volume on the surface is 3.91 liters. It tells me its pressure is 1.09 atmosphere and that the temperature on the top of the lake is 28.4 degrees Celsius. Now what's happening with this balloon is it's being taken and it's being pushed underwater. And so when it gets pushed down or pulled down to the bottom of the lake, um, the pressure is no longer 1.09 atmospheres. It becomes 3.7, which if you think about on the bottom of a lake, you're gonna have a lot more pressure. And the volume goes from being 3.91 to 1.09. So as that pressure increases, the volume of the balloon is gonna get smaller. But what the question is wanting to know is what's gonna happen to the temperature? And so immediately I know I'm working with gas laws. And so when I'm working with gas laws, temperatures has to be measured in kelvins. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna wanna convert this Celsius to kelvins. So the formula for going from Celsius to kelvins is you take your Celsius and you add 273.15. So I'm gonna take my 28.4 and I'm gonna add it to 273.15 and you're gonna get a kelvin temperature of 301.6. So this is going to be the temperature that you use in your gas laws. So since I actually have volume, pressure, and temperature, I'm going to use all of those variables in this equation. I'm not going to leave one out like I did in the other equation because none of them are constant. take my combined gas law equation, I'm just going to take all this information and plug it in. So the first or the initial scenario, I have 1.09 atmosphere and 3.91 liters. And I'm going to divide that by my temperature. Make sure your temperature stays in kelvins. And you're gonna use now your data from your second scenario. So P2 and T2 stays the variable because that's what we're solving for. Take a minute, pause it, try to work through the algebra, and then come back and check to see if you got the same thing I did. I'm not gonna work you through how to resolve the steps algebra. I would just recommend trying to put it all in your calculator in as little steps as possible. That way you round as little as possible, but you should get around 285 kelvins. And that would be the temperature of the balloon down at the bottom. So question number five gives you a list of several different scenarios of gases, and it wants you to choose in which one would the result in the gas behaving the most ideally, like the most ideal gas. And the reason we can't say an ideal gas law, an ideal gas is no law, no gas actually behaves ideal. For a gas to be ideal, it would have to take up no volume, and that's not really true because ga gases have masses and things that have mass take up space. Molecules would have to not be attracted to each other at all, and the collisions that happen within the gas would have to be elastic, meaning there would be like no transfer of energy. And so even though these would be gases behaving absolutely perfectly, and these gases, if they worked this way, they would mathematically work perfectly, 
there's not an actual gas that behaves ideally. But for equations to work, we try to use gases that get as close to the ideal gases as possible. And so there's a few rules that you can use to remember them. And so to behave close to being an ideal gas, we want it to have as high of a temperature as possible. We also want it to be as low of pressure want the gas to take up a small volume, but we want it to be in a big container. Because if the gases are in a very large container, they actually take up such a small amount of the volume, they're pretty close to having a smaller or a zero of a volume as is possible. So we're gonna look at two, in each part of this problem, there's two scenarios and I want you to pick the ones that are the most ideally behaved. So it tells us in all these scenarios, in the last one, well, all these scenarios, every one of them has one mole of gas. So we have one mole of gas at 275 degrees Kelvin and one mole of gas at 350 degrees Kelvin. And so I know that for it to behave ideally as possible, it needs to be at the highest temperature. And so the highest temperature is the one at 350 degree Kelvin. So for the next one, it gives me a mole of gas at pressure. So one's at 750 torr and one is at 1,500 torrs. And so for my gases to behave as close as possible, I want them to have the lowest pressure. And so the one with the lowest pressure is the first choice. So for C, my mole of gas can either be in a small container or it can be in a very large container. And if you remember, I talked about how you want a small amount of gas in a large container. They'll have less collisions, less movement of energy that way. And so that would be more ideal. So we want them to be in a large container. Being in a large container will also help keep that pressure low. D tells us I have a mole of hydrogen gas or I have a mole of C12, H4, Cl4, O2 under these exact same conditions. And so if you'll remember, the less volume that the gas particles take up, the more of an ideal gas they are. And so if I just look at this guy, he only has two element or two elements in its compound. This one is made up of 22. So this one has going to have one mole of H2 is going to have a lot less volume in the gas. 